Welcome to Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. Each week, you will learn how to grow your wealth through real estate investing, be introduced to the players that are getting it done, and learn how you can get involved. And now, here's your host, Darren Batchelder. Hello, everyone. Today, we have a very special guest. We've got Arn Senadella with us. Arn, I appreciate you coming on the show. Hey, Darren. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for inviting me on. Looking forward to having a nice chat about real estate. Absolutely. So just a little bit on how I know Arn. Um, we were both um, speakers. Uh, actually, Arn was the moderator of a panel that I was on, um, not this past January, but last January. And um, just a good guy. And we We've kind of connected through social media, and um, this is the first chance we, we've gotten to spend some time talking to each other, so I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, first question, how many properties and how many units are you currently invested in? Oh, well, that's a good question. So I would say individually, sole ownership, I probably own six or seven properties, maybe about 25 units. And these would typically be single family to uh, smaller two to four unit properties. And I probably have three or four smaller JV properties. These could be six to 12 unit properties. Then in terms of syndication, I believe I'm in eight syndications as a limited partner, maybe totaling about 1,200 units. And as a general partner, I'm in four syndications, totaling about 433 units. So I have a pretty broad spectrum of investments in real estate and uh, kind of like doing it all. There's pros and cons to each approach, and I, I don't see any reason to limit myself to one. Fantastic. So let's start with, um, you know, in terms of what were you doing prior to getting into to investing in real estate? What was your background? Well, uh, so I was trained to be a mathematician and chemist. I got a graduate. Are you degree. kidding me? Really? Yeah, no, I got a graduate degree from University of Michigan way back in 1977. So I'm dating myself a little bit. Uh, I actually I like having somebody that's a little <laughs> senior. I, usually I'm like interviewing people that like, I'm like, how'd you do it at such a young age? You know, so it, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, uh, life's perspectives shape people's opinions and so forth and kind of worldview. So I uh, hopefully I'll be able to, you know, offer a little slightly different perspective than many of the people on on your show. Um, and so I thought I wanted to teach, be a research scientist, but uh, during grad school, I had to come to the conclusion that really wasn't for me. So um, my father had opened a residential real estate brokerage business in Menlo Park, California. So we had about a five minute call. He said, come on out get your license and I'll put you to work. And so in March 1978, I got my real estate license, Menlo Park, California, basically next to Palo Alto, uh, better known as Silicon Valley. And I had the good fortune of um, selling residential real estate, but worked with a fair number of investors for over 35 years. Wow, that's fantastic. So you, you got... I mean, that's crazy that you were going to be a chemist <laughs> and then you're in grad school and you end up deciding, all right, I'm going to go work for dad. And, uh, and you've been in, it, it worked out because you stayed in the business for the, you know, that long. So yes. you were in residential real estate for 35 years. Yes. And, uh, it, it, it's, you know, it's interesting how life evolves and how small decisions can have big impact in the direction of one's life. And, um, Yes, it turned out to be very good for me. Uh, my father taught me the brokerage business, but really he taught me the investment business because he understood while the brokerage business produces good income, really the investing is what's going to lead to financial wealth, security, and freedom. So he was a single family home investor, kind of an old school guy. And I just kind of modeled his behavior. 
I just happened to be, I was blessed to grow up in the San Francisco Peninsula and probably the greatest re residential real estate market in the world and started investing in the Bay Area as well as elsewhere across the country. And, um, you know, was able to create kind of a, a good work-life balance for me through my real estate investing. Fantastic. So yeah. at what point did you actually start in investing, not just working in the brokerage business, but started to invest? At so, what point? yeah, so I probably started like most people. You reach a certain age, it's time to buy a house. So I bought my first house 1980. Uh, I remember it was in kind of a rougher neighborhood right up against Bayshore Freeway, which is Highway 101 that runs from San Francisco to San Jose. And I can tell you, I paid 107.5 for that property back <laughs> in September 1980. And interestingly enough, for those who remember, Late 1980 is when mortgage rates started going from about 10 or 11 percent all the way to 16 and 17 percent in the early uh, in the spring of 1981. Residential mortgages were about 16 and a half. So I paid 11 and three quarters for my first mortgage. So when I see rates today at 3.25, 3.75, uh, it's pretty good. My dad told me long ago. Anytime you can borrow money for single digit interest rates, it's a good lending market. And of course, now we're kind of in uncharted territory. Um, so bought my first house 1980, lived there about six years. And then like many people, was ready to move into a better neighborhood, a bigger house, kept my existing residence as a rental. And from there, it just kind of snowballed and I built uh a portfolio maybe of 35, 40 houses uh, in the Bay Area, in the Austin, Texas area, and of all things in Charlottesville, Virginia, where my father eventually kind of retired and relocated to. So we started investing back there. Mm. So yeah. I've, I've never invested in single family homes, but the multifamily investors that I've talked to that started there they kind of tell me when you get to somewhere between 10 and 20 homes and they're self-managing that it just starts to become too much. So that's 35 to 40 homes is a lot. Were you self-managing or did you have somebody that was managing that for you? Well, the local properties I self-managed, the ones out of area, I had a property manager. So it was a little bit of both. So in Austin and in Charlottesville, I had professional property management. In the Bay Area, I basically took care of my own rentals. And yes, uh, it did get to be a little bit much, and we'll cover it later on in our talk, I'm sure, as to why I made the transition. And certainly the hassle of managing all these properties was one of the reasons I did that. I guess the thing I would say is, unlike your typical W-2 career investor. I was a real estate broker, right? So I'm out and about in the community, meeting with buyers, sellers, tenants, contractors, stagers, landscapers. So the management of my properties was kind of just part and parcel of my overall real estate activities where if somebody was working at uh, Apple computer and working 60 hours a week, they don't have time to run out at 10 a.m. to go meet a contractor to get something fixed. So right. I had a little bit of an advantage there. But yes, the management becomes intensive. Um, and that was one of the reasons I eventually switched to multifamily. Uh, though I'm a little slow, so I didn't switch to multifamily till about 2020. So it took me about 40 years of doing single family. And I think the other thing I would say is um, one size does not fit all. And what I mean by that, uh, I really believe in real estate investing. And there are numerous ways one can go about investing in real estate and I think it's up for each individual to kind of find their niche and works work with them. So 
if somebody said to me, hey, I want to build a single family rental portfolio, I'm going to say bravo because it's tried and true. It will work. If, on the other hand, somebody says real estate's not my expertise between work, family, kids, community and church, I don't have an extra moment. I don't know the business. I don't want to take care of tenants, repairs. So I want a more passive investment. Then I think that's the right solution for them. So I think sometimes we get caught into there's one right way. And I don't believe that there's numerous ways you can go about investing in real estate and creating wealth. I I think that that's very well said. And, and it's, I, th- I would agree. Um, and sometimes people have to start, you know, it's all mindset, right? Some people have to start smaller and then they may do it and then they just want to replicate that. And that's fine, like you said. And then there's other people that may start small and then they're like, okay, well, now I understand that. How do I do the next thing? And, you know, that could lead you into, you know, bigger properties, but it's not a requirement. It's not the only way to build wealth. Is And I think that's a, a very good point. Yes. And it, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an old school guy. So I kind of believe in fundamentals and step by step progress, uh, building proper foundation kind of each step of the way. Uh, I find that's kind of a more conservative approach uh, where many in the space now kind of say, go big as soon as you can. And I can't argue with that. Many people have been successful doing that. It's just not my kind of personality. And even now in my multifamily business, uh, despite 40 years in the real estate industry, I'm fairly new in the multifamily business. So most of the deals I put together are smaller three, four, five million dollar deals because handling other people's money is a big responsibility. And in order for me to ask people to invest with me or in my investments, I have to know I can do the job. So for me, I kind of got to prove it to myself that, okay, I've got this down, I'm ready to take it to the next stage. So that that's kind of how I approach it. And again, others can do different. Uh, this is just what works for me. Absolutely. So um, why did you shift? So, you know, to 2020, you said that you started to invest in multifamily. Why did you do it? Yeah, so... Um, It was interesting. Uh, I have a young friend here in Greenville. He's probably mid thirties now, probably on to his seventh or eighth eighth syndication. And uh, we'll talk about real estate and uh, we kind of supported and followed each other. And in March of 2020, he calls me on the phone one day and he goes, hey, Arn, what do you think is going to happen with rents? And it, and if we reflect back, March 2020 was about when we became fully aware of COVID right. and the major impacts it was going to have. And people were afraid. We didn't know what was going on. So he calls me middle of March. Hey, Arn, what do you think is going to happen with your rent collection? And I said, well, Mario, I don't know. Call me April 5th and we'll talk about it, right? So I wanted to kind of see how my rents came in and then I would know. At the end of the phone call, he sent me a podcast on multifamily and kind of a light bulb just went off. Prior to that, I had started buying smaller multifamilies, four units, six, 10, 12. And so I was kind of moving in that direction Um, but that call, COVID, kind of everything slowed down, gave me time to really, I probably listened to three, four hours of podcasts a day. And then with my real estate experience, most of it came second nature to me. And as I investigated, it made a lot of sense. And you mentioned another point is, I've done single family for 40 years. And honestly, I was a little bored with it. And I wanted to do something different. And I can tell you, um, 
I've so much enjoyed learning a new aspect of the business. Uh, it's residential real estate. It's what I've done all my life. I'm not going to do office buildings. I'm not going to do industrial. I really love the networking with people like you. Uh, I'm going to my first in-person conference here in about two weeks in Colorado. Fantastic. Excited about oh, the that. The best yes. ever conference? The best ever, yes. Yeah, so, good one. Uh, so um, we can discuss all the, the logical reasons why I moved to multifamily, certainly. But some of it was I just wanted to try something new. And uh, the other thing I would say to back up to my math science background once I got my residential career going in the Bay Area, I ended up taking all the CCIM coursework, which, as you know, it's a very prestigious commercial designation. It's five one week long courses, and then you got to document real world experience and success in commercial real estate. And so even back then, I was kind of toying with making the shift from residential to commercial. Um, but I was at the point of my life, I was recently married, I had a baby on the way, Alex, my oldest son, and I just maybe didn't have the courage to leave the lucrative residential business I had built to go to commercial. So in some ways, my decision in 2020 kind of circles back to my education and training uh, and it's been a, a good move for me, and uh, I enjoy helping people invest. Uh, it's a way people can invest without dealing with the the day to day headaches of property management and so forth. So I get some satisfaction from doing that. That's fantastic. So a few things that you yeah. said, um, and I I think it's important for listeners is that look, I mean, you were bored. Right. You, you, you knew what you were doing. You did it over and over again. And, and at some point, I think it doesn't matter how much money you're making. You know, if you if you just rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat and, and you don't have that challenge factor that you could get stuck. You know, it doesn't matter if you you hit that financial freedom, you know, bucket. Um, you're continuing to do that. So, you know, listeners, if you're bored, you know, if you if you want to try something new in your life, you know, whether it's real estate investing, which we're talking about here, or starting your own company or doing whatever, listen to your gut, you know, listen to that and don't keep shoving it down because you only have one life to live. Um, the other thing you said was courage. You know, it does take courage to go after something new, right? And you don't necessarily know what the outcome is going to be, right? Um, but then what's very cool about moving from, you know, single family to doing the small deals to doing syndications now is you said you like to help people invest. And, you know, with syndications, you get that opportunity where you can take your knowledge and then bring other people for the ride and they don't have to participate in finding the deal and putting the financing together and raising the capital and managing the deal. They could just provide you some funds and then you do it. So yes. um, talk about where you find investors and kind of what's their, what's been their, um, feedback back to you in terms of um, being involved with some of your transactions? Sure. So it's a great question. Um, so I come from Silicon Valley. I sold real estate there a long time. I have a good database of friends, clients, business associates. And as you can well imagine, most of them are fairly well uh, invested in the stock market. They have significant stock market investments. And so um, one of my approaches is just talk to them about diversification, right? Um, uh, I'm a real estate guy. I'd say in my personal portfolio, half of my net worth's in real estate, half is in the market. And in the stock market, I have a professional advisor and I just do what he says, okay? I trust him. 
he makes recommendations and invariably I just follow him. So I know I don't know Wall Street. I don't know the market, but I see benefit of having some of my capital there. And I also see the benefit of having some in real estate, what I do know. So with many of my past friends and clients, it's a discussion of just diversifying your portfolio, maybe taking 5, 10, 15 percent of your net worth and transitioning it to real estate. And I think most people understand the value of real estate, right? Uh, they live in major metropolitan areas. They see the prices of houses going up. They understand real estate is a secure long-term investment. So I think what holds most of them back is either they don't have the knowledge and expertise to run these assets or they just don't have the time. And I can tell you, uh, one of my best investors is uh, a young woman who used to work for me uh, at Cobalt Banker in, in Menlo Park. And her mom and I were the same generation. The daughter joined the mom. Uh, the daughter's now probably 45. She manages three offices in the Bay Area, okay, probably 250 agents, uh, makes great money, mother of three, and she had no real estate investments, okay? So here's someone managing hundreds of real estate agents, certainly understanding the value of real estate, but the truth is her husband has a demanding W-2 job, career job. She's got a demanding job. Trust me, trying to herd 250 residential agents right. is, a, is a big lift. So she started to invest with me. And so she understood the value of real estate, but she doesn't have the time to breathe to really look in it. And so I find a lot of my investors are of a similar situation in life between work and family, they're just jammed and they, 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 they appreciate the opportunity to put some of their net worth in real estate. Yeah, that's huge. So what did she, what's been her take in terms of say performance, the time she has to be involved, um, any tax benefits that she's received? Like what, it, what is she telling you that she sees the benefit and the value of of doing that diversification? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say um, she speaks with her checkbook because she keeps investing, right? right. And so the, the, proof, the proof's in the pudding. And I, as you know, when you do well by your investors, you now have a repeat investor. So the next deal comes along, they go, hey, Darren put me in a good deal over here. He's got another one in the same market. I'm in because I've seen what he's done. So she's she's happy with no headaches, regular distributions. Uh, that a benefit for her is she's an active real estate professional and therefore well situated to take advantage of the passive losses that syndication investments can generate. So she's a pretty happy camper. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say is I never promise the moon to my investors. In my mind, you know, if you can get seven or eight percent cash on cash return, if you can get IRRs of 14, 15 percent in a low risk investment, that's a win, right? right? That, that, that's a win. I mean, people should be satisfied with that. If they're not, then maybe their expectations are a little askew. And, and, and granted, we've had 10 years of unbelievable growth in multifamily. COVID didn't really slow it down. COVID made us take a breath and it kept on going up. One thing that I have from being in the real estate business 40 years, if I've been through a few cycles, I've been through a few markets, and I don't know when we're going to have a little correction, but I know at some point we are going to have a little correction. And so you say, you say little, it's it. funny because like being your front, you were doing business in Silicon Valley. California is the biggest up and down real estate market there is. Right. I mean, so you've been through some markets where it's not just a little downturn. 
You know, in California, you could have some serious swings both up and down. It, yeah, it, it, it would vary depending on the area. So, like, for example, on the peninsula during the uh, subprime crisis recession, um, values on the peninsula, good upper middle income neighborhoods, maybe they drop five to 10 oh, percent. So it that's wasn't a bloodbath. Right. But out in the Central Valley, two hours from San Francisco, where developers just kept building tract home, tract home, tract home, there you saw values drop 50 percent. Wow. So you're right about that. So I think it's a little bit market specific. And certainly I lived through the dot com boom. I lived through the dot com bust. And so uh, somebody who's gotten into the real estate space in the last five years hasn't been through these cycles. I sold houses when interest rates were 16 and a half percent adjustable. Um, so it gives you a little bit of perspective that it's not always up, 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 and you have to kind of be smart and savvy and understand there's going to be some downturns. And what I would say is if you use leverage properly, if you're properly capitalized, meaning good reserves, you can ride out some difficult times as a real estate investor. And as long as you ride out those times, I can almost guarantee you when you come out the other end, you're going to be happy you stuck in it um, uh, because long term, the trend for real estate just has to be up. I don't see any other way it's going yeah. to go. Yeah, I mean, so I've, I've asked people like, do you know anybody that has saved their way to wealth? And I have not gotten an answer saying yes. You know, I mean, just saving 10% of your W-2 and putting it into the stock market and, you know, building your next egg. I mean, the difference between doing that and investing in, in assets, hopefully cash producing assets, cash flow producing assets. But, I mean, even you have 50% in the stock market, 50% in, in, um, real estate, owning assets that appreciate over time is where most people build their wealth. And real estate is, is one where, um, you know, you've seen the quotes, 90% of, of millionaires have, have built their wealth through, through real estate. Um, but there is a true fear factor for people that have never invested. And what I think you said in the beginning is critical that there's, you know, there's different ways to invest. You, you could decide to purchase your first single family home or, or you move from your, your house like you did and then just rent it out and move to another house. Um, you could do small duplexes and fourplexes and eight plexes and, or you can do syndications and you could on the syndication side, you could be a GP like you are, and then bring other people or what's what's great and which I didn't know about until four years ago was there's the ability to passively invest in these syndications. And so you find a syndicator like Arn and you invest alongside them and they're doing the heavy lifting and the management. Um, they have a property management company that's typically managing it day to day, but they're overseeing it. Um, and it's a way to get involved and, and grow wealth from that perspective. So, um, you know, I think that fear stops a lot of people from getting involved. What's your take on that? Yes. Uh, people people are, are, are fearful to do something that they're not familiar with. Uh, though, of course, when you sit there and watch the stock market go up and down, that might create right. a little fear and you might you, you might think about another way to do it. And what I would so I, what I would say, you know, syndications really have only been wildly available for about the last 10 to 12 years. I think there was a tax law change that opened it up to kind of average Americans, common Americans. And I think it's a great way 
for people to invest in something they intuitively know is a good thing. We know the population's growing. We know we have a housing shortage in this country, and there's really no solution to it. Nobody's really said, oh yeah, we're going to build 10 million homes in the next two years and solve it. it, it it's going to be a continuing problem. And I think the nice thing about syndication investment, and when a lot of my investors are first-time syndicate syndication investments, investors, and I talk to them about, you know, you don't go all in on your first investment, right? If you have a nest egg of two hundred and fifty thousand investable cash, do not throw all two fifty into the first deal you would see. No, don't do that. What I would say is invest 50 over here, invest 50 here, spread it around a little bit so you have some diversification, and then you'll get to see how that feels over the next year or so, and you'll be able to determine, is this something that you have good comfort with? Uh, you'll find operators maybe you like better than others. You might find markets that you like better than others. So don't put all your chips in. Kind of dip your toe in, get a little exposure. Look, there's going to be another great deal six months from now, okay? They don't disappear. <laughs> they keep coming. So just take it slow, get your feet wet, see how you like it. And I think if you do it that way, I mean, the fear comes when you put every last dollar you have to your name into an investment. I wouldn't do that. So I, that would terrify so I, me. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's not just if you put all your eggs in, in, because I know my first passive deal in real estate, and I had been, you know, trading loan portfolios for years, but I'd never invested in real estate, and and I had money in the stock market, and all and it didn't, you know. And like you said, it could drop by 20% or 50% just like that. But it was like what was familiar and what was, you know, talked about. And everybody's supposed to do that. Um, but the first time I invested in a, in a passive deal, it wasn't, you know, 100% of my portfolio. But I was still scared. You know, I was like, I didn't know. You know, I didn't know how it would pan out. I didn't know if it was a good decision or a bad decision. And I think that, um, you know, I read a lot of self-development books and I, 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 and I talk to a lot of people and I think that people are more, and I fell into that camp, I, people are more afraid of losing than they are, you know, have hope of, of gaining, you know. So, you know, that will hold people back from making that decision to try, to try it. Yes. Yes. And, and and I think it sounds like you educated yourself about the space, about limited partner investments, about syndications. I imagine you probably interviewed a variety of Absolutely. operators. And, 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 and I did so all the things that you were supposed to do, should... like listen to podcasts, read books. <laughs> You know, joined a mentorship group, got referrals, met the syndicators, you know, vetted which ones I wanted to work with. But still, wiring that first 50 or 75,000 was like, oh, man. And it all worked out great. I made great money off of it. But, you know, I, you didn't know at the time, right? Um, um, and I think that's instructive for us who are on the GP side to not forget what it's like for an LP making their yeah, first investment, absolutely. right? So there has to be there has to be a degree of understanding and compassion and and putting yourself in the other person's shoes. This is what we do. We talk all time. We talk with syndicators all over the country. We buy and sell property. This is what we do. And sometimes we fall into the trap thinking, well, this is easy and everybody should get it, but it's not yeah, the way it no, works. That's, that's a great point is I, I think that understanding uh, what they may be going through and the emotions they may be going through um, uh, as a first time investor, cause, cause look, the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and 10th, you know, passive investment after that, you know, was, didn't feel the same. It's that first, you know, one or two. Um, 
and you had made a comment earlier more talking about life that if you feel yourself stuck you know you kind of got to go for it and so i think the same thing kind of applies and and like for me i'm a perfect example of that lifelong silicon valley resident my my life partner and girlfriend Laura and I decided to pull up roots and move to Greenville, South Carolina, seven years ago. And we knew nobody. We had visited for three days, but intuitively in our gut, we knew it was right. We took the leap of faith, packed up, moved clear across country, and have been happy as clams. And so you get back to that fear and how do you work through it? Um, and I think they all often say when you're uncomfortable, you're kind of at a right, growth right. edge, right? So that that's what tells you you're on the precipice of doing some growth. And I, I forget, Einstein may have said something. The day you start stop learning is the day you start dying, right? So I think bringing it all back around about the idea of new experiences, keep growing, keep living, it, it all kind of yeah, ties ab together. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I don't want to go out, off on this tangent too much, be, but <laughs> <Okay>. I will <laughs> share like, so now, you know, I, I I'm kind of, I'm like you, like I understand the multifamily world. Right. Um, but four years ago I didn't. And so I'm playing golf with some guys, actually got a multifamily guy who, called me but he's a younger guy right like and so i'm like look you're a young guy like what's up with all this crypto and metaverse and all this like <laughs> i don't understand it and so there's a piece of me that's like okay is this just like the dot com thing where it just goes up and then plummets or am i just an older guy who is naive and and, and who is not taking the time to learn about a different industry i don't know the answer and and again like i don't I go too far on it, but you know, that's a, a responsibility on myself that I have to do some educating of myself. Um, and well, I'm with you, Darren. I don't have any crypto, I don't understand it. I'm not buying any crypto, and call me an old fuddy duddy, but it's okay. Yeah, but me. you know, the thing is, is like, okay, well, <laughs> I'm 51, and if I think I'm gonna live till over 100, then I'm like, well, this 50 years is you know, if 20 years from now, if, you know, is there something gonna be there or not? I don't, I don't know the answer, but the point is, is that look, listeners. You you have to trust your gut. I mean, Arn, you know, was in single family for a long time, and I didn't ask him this, but I would imagine that he probably wishes he, you know, took that chance a little bit earlier. And you know, you you have to take the chance. But then he went and moved across country. That was a risk, right? He could always move back, right? Um, but he took the risk, and it turned out fantastic for him. So um, talk about perseverance and determination and and how that plays into um you know getting into something new yeah it uh so in general i tend to be a pretty optimistic person right uh uh i also believe i'm kind of the captain of my own ship and and you know my actions can impact my destiny uh if i didn't think that why would I ever get out of bed, right? If you don't believe your actions can kind of create the life that you want, not that it's going to be easy. And uh, I tend to be a little bit of a plotter and I'll just keep going. And um, the, the other thing I think is with real estate, particularly, it's a long-term right. gig. And if you just stay consistent and determined, uh, you're gonna win. You just have to kind of stay on that path, not get distracted. And if occasionally some rough winds come in, you just keep marching through. So um, what I have found in the transition of multifamily is um, I started as a LP investor, probably did three or four. Uh, as a conversation with one of the GPs, I mentioned, Hey, I've been able to raise capital for other real estate deals. Uh, would like to start raising capital for multifamily deals. And he said, well, 
hey, if we have a need, I'll let you know. And about a month after that call, he called me up. He goes, hey, we got a deal in Augusta, Georgia. We need some help. Are you willing? So I kind of jumped in and then it just kind of kept continuing on that path. And I think your first couple are always the toughest. And then when you kind of have a little success, uh, that builds confidence and it makes the next couple that. So the first one's always the hardest is kind of that hurdle you got to get over. And then it, it, you still need to keep moving forward. But kind of breaking through on that first one or two, it then starts to fall in, par, fall yeah, in place absolutely. for you. I mean, look, you could li listen to as many podcasts, read as many books, but until you actually take action and start doing it, there's just certain things that you're just not going to learn. Right. And, and so, you know, getting out and doing that first deal, buying that first, you know, investment home or that duplex or fourplex or getting into your first passive deal. I mean, those are all scary things, but then after you do it, it's not as scary anymore. And then you start looking for the next thing. And that's what I've learned from talking to some people that are super, super, super um, successful is that they all started with one investment, every single person. Right. And then <laughs> yes. that led them to something else that led them to something else that led them to something else. And that's, you know, that progress that, you know, that itch that you keep on trying to, to, to go after and get uncomfortable with is, is, um, is critical. And some people just let fear keep them in their spot, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, uh, it's OK to be cautious. It's OK to be prudent like anything else in life. It, 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 you want to find the proper balance. And I'll admit, sometimes I've leaped in my life before I looked and I might have taken a lump or two. But I also always had a confidence that I'm just going to land on my feet and kind of whatever life throws my way. I'm just going to keep going. Um, and as we know, the multifamily space is very competitive now, and you have to kind of develop a street credibility with the brokers and the sellers to actually land a deal. So if you can get those first one or two under your belt, it just increases kind of your street cred and then gives you a higher probability to get that next one. So you kind of got to pay your dues to get in the space, like pretty much any other profession. You pay your dues and you kind of earn your way and you prove your worth. And you, you I'm glad that progress. you brought that up, that it's competitive because it is. I mean, <laughs> it, in the large scale multifamily world, it is competitive. And, you know, so if you're a new guy and I've seen people in these multifamily mentorship groups, they, you know, they sign their check to join and then they just think that it, they're going to get a deal. And I'm like, look, if you're not willing to fight, kick and scratch, like, and figure it out and get yourself out there, you know, it doesn't matter that you've stroke the check. You're, you have all the resources at your fingertips, but you still got to do the work. You still got, you still got to put yourself out there. Yeah, exactly. The, um, the, uh, first syndication deal I closed here as a lead sponsor in Greenville was from a relationship that I had built with a broker here over about a period of a year and a half. So it, it wasn't like I called him up on the phone and 30 days later, he said, hey, Arn, here, go buy this thing. It took me about a year and a half to build the relationship. We looked at several other properties. They just weren't quite right. Um, so it takes time to build those relationships. You have to put in the work. Just get out in the market. Look at those properties. Get to know the brokers. Get to know the property managers in your market of choice, wherever that happens to be. And um, coming from California, I can joke about this. Every multifamily broker in the Southeast or in Texas always gets a call from the California investor, right? So it's kind of a stereotype. So what I would su suggest is you need to get on a plane and actually get in that location and get face to face with the broker. 
it, just doing it on the phone, they're not really going to give you the time of day. You got to show that you're willing to take the time, trouble, and money to get there and and build those relationships face to face. Uh, uh, because trust me, brokers get uh, 50 calls a day about property. And how are you going to stand out unless they've sat down with you across that, the table? That's a great, or great, great, great point. I mean, it's relationship business. And um, I think on the large scale, you, you know, you need to, you need to partner with somebody who has experience to get your first deal, you know? And so you find somebody else that already has that street cred and that's the value that they bring. And then you do, you know, the, the busy work of going out and finding the right deal. And then you bring that person on as a partner. Um, because otherwise you like, Arn said, you're going to call these brokers and they're going to be like, Bob, who, you know, like you're just, you're just going to get put at the back of the line. And it doesn't matter if, if you know, you have a solid deal and you can raise the capital or, or if you have the capital sitting on the sideline, I mean, all of that. Um, I mean, I guess if you have the money in the bank, you can prove it and you're paying more than somebody else that has the street cred that you might, you might still get a chance, but. Yes. And like I, you're exactly right on my first syndication deal. I had joined a uh, small uh, short term mentoring program, developed a closer relationship with an experienced operator that I had known for about two years. Our initial contact was me as an LP and him as a GP. And um, so he kind of held my hand through the process. We got agency debt. He had agency debt experience. We had the net worth, but we didn't have the, the agency debt experience. But he helped my partner and I, Brian, along through the deal. He's now been our KP on our second deal. So you need those people in your camp to, to, to help bring these deals across the finish line. And I can tell you, actually completing my first syndication deal as the lead operator I learned so much. It was just unbelievable. There were frustrating times. There were difficult times. One day I might have been down and my partner Brian picked me up and then vice versa. But uh, because there are so many moving parts on these syndication deals and you got to kind of all bring them together right at that correct moment to be able to get it across the finish line. And so it was really a learning experience. And once you get that under your belt, now the confidence picks up and uh, you're that, off and running. That's funny. That's so true. So true. Um, hey, how do you, <laughs> how do you, because you ta talked about some of your investors, a lot of, a lot of your investors are first time passive investors. How do you attract people to you that were maybe not inside your network initially? What do you do to try to attract people? Because you said that, you know, look, the syndication space has grown dramatically over the last 10 to 12 years. And, and I would, I've only been in it for four years and in that four years, I've seen it grow dramatically, but I still know a lot of people that don't get any emails asking them to join a multifamily deal. Like they don't get invited to any of them and they have the funds. So, and I was that way prior to four years ago, like you still have to get invited to be a part of these deals. So how do you attract and educate people that don't, haven't done it before? Yep. Uh, great question. And, uh, uh, this was actually the panel discussion that you and other operators talked about at the MFIN Summit. Uh, it's called kind of building a platform, uh, building a educational resource. The platform could be a website uh, containing information and, and education about syndication investments. Uh, for me, being on podcasts has been the way I've probably uh, attracted people sure. who weren't already in my social or professional sphere. So for me, the podcast medium has done very well in attracting new people. And so uh, I'm slowly building my database. 
Um, and I would say in the couple, three or four deals I've been lead sponsor on, I would say typically maybe 50 to 60% of the investors are people I know and in a previous life, let's call it that, sure. right? Friends, family, old business associates, where maybe a 30 to 40% have been new investors that I've That's picked fantastic. up along the way. So uh, put content out there, help educate people, get on podcasts, write blog posts, um, go to meetups. There are a lot of online meetups. Uh, you can go to in-person meetups and just kind of network. And that's how I built my investor database. Yeah, I think that, that's awesome. I, so. I've heard other people say, too, that, um, you know, they just, even before they got their first deal, before they, you know, even some, some people, even before they invested passively in their first deal, they started to, you know, put it out on social media that, so that their network, like, Hey, I'm looking at real estate deals. I'm not, you know, and then all of a sudden you find that some other people that you're in your network that you didn't even know have an interest there. They want to learn from you. So like, Hey, what'd you learn? Like what, maybe what are some good meetups to go to where I can learn, you know, who are, what are some good podcasts? What are some good books? Like, and it just starts the ball rolling where, and those people could end up being investors with you you know, when you get your first syndication deal. So you don't have to wait until you get your first deal to start telling people what you're doing. Uh, precisely. And what I would say is for me and my experience, uh, it works better when I just let other people know what I'm doing. I'm not asking them to do anything. I'm not asking them for money. I'm not asking them to invest. I'm just letting people know. Like when you go to a cocktail party, right? I'm sure hey, at what some do do? point the conversation <laughs> goes to real estate, right? <laughs> well, what, well, what do you do? Yes. But also, hey, did you see what that right. house down the street sold for or, or whatever? So, uh, you know, so you just kind of put it out there in the universe, Uh the 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 guy or gal who cuts your hair may have an uncle who has a 40 unit building that they want to sell so you just you just let people know what you're doing and what i found is if they're interested they'll come to you because they kind of have a notion they'd like to do it but they don't know really how to take that first step and so if you simply just talk about, yeah, I, I'm going to Charlotte tomorrow to look at a 40 unit building, your, your neighbor may go, well, cool, tell me more. I've been wanting to invest in real estate and I don't really know how. Can you help me out? So I think just let people know what you're doing and that will attract potential business to you much better than going, Hey, I've got a deal. I need to raise a million dollars. Do you got 50,000 you want to invest? That's yeah, going to turn so, people I mean, off. On those, on those two uh, topics, one, you know, telling people what you do is a, is a great um, soft approach, right? It's, it's um, no, no risk. And it's, it lets people know and, and it gives them kind of the onus of, and there's a lot of people out there that they, they're like, I want to do this, but I just don't know how. And I don't know who to do it with. And, and I've had people reach out to me and we met up with coffee and they're like, you know, I didn't, I just didn't know anybody local that did this. And, uh, you know, can I get in your next deal? And I'm like, sure. And that, you know, that's a very soft way for that to happen. Um, I would say that on the flip side though, um, you know, when you do have a deal, I, I'm, a, I would recommend that you do pr offer it out to your entire network and because you shouldn't be making the decision for them. It's an opportunity for them to invest. It's not, you need their money. Right. I think that there's two different ways to look at it. And so I, what I learned from my first syndication deal was where I was flipping through my phone and there were certain people that I was like, oh, that guy will never invest, right? And I'm like, how, Darren, how can you make that decision for him? And I text the person, next thing you know, hey, let's get grab coffee and talk about this thing. And then they invest. And another person, I'm like, oh, this guy's a no-brainer, right? 
And that person says, hey, I just bought this other company and I don't have any capital. Like, you just don't know. So um, you don't have to be hard about it, but yeah, I think that you should present the opportunity. Oh, 100%. So if uh, to, 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 to clarify, I think once you've made some kind of contact and you've had some kind of discussion with an individual where they've expressed interest in multifamily, then certainly you have to present every opportunity. So um, I have automations where after I've made contact and had a conversation with an investor and uh, it's apparent that syndication investment would be suitable for that individual because it's not suitable for everyone. They get put into my deal alert list. So every deal I do get, I do send out an email blast. And right now my database is probably 480 investors. So yes, but that is after I've established contact and had some kind of financial discussion with them where they have indicated to me, yes, Arn, I'm interested. Yes, I want to be put on your list. Please let me know. Uh, and of course, as you know, depending on your offerings, 506C or 506B, 506B, which is what I primarily do, uh, I have to have a prior relationship with the investor before I can really talk specific investments to them. Uh, but the 506C, accredited investors only, you can broadcast it a little wider. So certainly, and your thought about the mindset is, yes, we're not asking them for money. We're presenting an opportunity to them is exactly right. And the thing is, if they want to invest, great. If they don't want and there's to some invest, in between. Fine. It, they, it they doesn't may not make any difference. We're not be ready invested. on yes. this deal, but they still have questions, and and that might be the learning, the yes. starting of the learning process for that that person. They and they missed this deal, but then a year or two later, they're you know they're like, okay, now I'm ready, and so you you never do know. Hey, what's the next big stretch goal for for Arm? Um. Yeah, next big stretch goal. Uh, it's interesting. I haven't been a super goal setter in my life. I know that's <laughs> criminal and I should be banned, but, you know, it goes against everything. So uh, uh, I say that there's half always jokingly. A, there's always a time um, to start, my so, man. <laughs> Right. Yeah, yeah. No, it's never too late. I'm only 67. So um, because I've uh, so it's interesting. Uh with goals, I think it's more about activity, not so much results, if that makes sense, right? So the goal should involve the activities to produce the results. And if you're doing the right activities, the chips are going to fall where they may. And there are a lot of, uh, a lot of factors that, that impact that. Um, but if I had a goal, my goal would be to start moving up into larger syndication deals. So the ones I've done to date have been primarily in the Greenville, South Carolina area. They've typically been 30, 40, 50 unit buildings, three, four, five million dollar projects. Now that I've got three or four of those under my belt uh, and I have my team in place here, uh, I feel confident on tackling a bigger property, a bigger asset. So I think the 2022 goal would be start to acquire slightly larger assets. In my mind, I'm kind of thinking eight, nine, ten million dollars. That's kind of to me seems to be a legitimate jump. The other thing is I'm developing a second market in what's called the triad of North Carolina, which is Greensboro, Winston-Salem, and High Point. And uh, I have one asset under contract there. We have an accepted LOI on another. So it's about a three hour drive from where I am. And so I wanna develop that market and kind of get together the team there. In Greenville, I have my team put together. 
Uh, I have my property manager, my asset manager, kind of my contractor. So I'm all over everything in Greenville because I know I have the team members that can execute the plan. Um, I'm more kind of a big picture acquisition, investor guy, see the big picture, see the vision. I'm not as good in the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts. So my partner is great on the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts. So we have our areas of expertise. We communicate and collaborate, but we're kind of in charge of our separate tasks and it works really well. It gives me a lot of confidence knowing Brian's on the team and he can handle his end of the job. I need to develop the same kind of team up in the triad. So that's the other goal for 2022. And uh, I, I imagine I'll Fantastic. make some headway. Well, I would, um, yeah. look, you're a very accomplished guy and have been in the business for a long time between residential and multifamily. Um, I do see people who do set goals. They, it pushes them. Right. So like, you know, you're like saying, well, uh, uh, maybe a larger, like, you know, you don't have to say it on this, on this call, but like, I would just freaking write it down. Like I want two deals that are $10 million or greater or $8 million yeah. and greater. Like, and, and then it's, it does stick in your mind. I had one, I had one um, gentleman that came on and he was, I'm going to buy a two unit then I'm going to buy a four unit the next year and then an eight unit. And, and then he got to the point where he was like, all right, I got to buy, you know, eight units this year. He, he's like, what if I change my goal? I'm like, and he did. And I'm like, what'd you change to? He said, 800 units. I'm like, where'd you come in? Like 454. But like, if he had stuck at eight, he never would have gotten to 454, right? Like, look, you, you got it. And, and also you're a guy who said that you got bored. Like, so, all right. I, I just challenged yeah. you a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, no, no, it, it's okay. Uh, I appreciate the constructive uh, criticism, uh, and it, it, there is some validity there. Uh, and it's never, never, I'm never too old to learn something new. Uh, so it's an interesting thing for me to ponder and see if I could execute. I do have affirmations put up on on Your my mirror, right? <laughs> bathroom mirror, right. and so yeah, you know, so. Uh, I, I do believe in look. I believe in you. I'm sure your wife believes in you. You got all these thinking. investors that are believe yeah. in you. Like, <laughs> all right, I can't wait to talk to you next year, and you've got it done. So, yeah. hey, uh, what do you like to do for fun outside okay. of work? Okay. Uh, well, I'm kind of a fitness fanatic, so I enjoy uh, keeping fit, and Fantastic. Uh, I play a lot of golf. So, would, would one love of these that. days we'll have to get together. So. Uh, uh, I, I've played golf since I was eight years old. So counting that's, uh, 59 years and, um, it's a fabulous game. Uh, love being out there with my friends and the outdoors and it's a mental challenge. It's really a fascinating game. I know you play and if people, it looks silly like my from daughter, the outside. She doesn't get it, you know, like, she, you know, like, you know, but <laughs> it, it is, I mean, it's one, one day you got one shot that's working and the next day it, that doesn't work, but another shot works. And like, you know, but in any event, you're out with your buddies and you're having a little competition and, and, uh, it's, it's all fun. A little competition and, and trust me, war is glad to get me <laughs> out of that. That's house. great. Hey, so Arn, <laughs> if somebody wants to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, I'm active on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, my business so what's is the, Spark what, what's Investment the website? Group. And uh, it would be investwithspark.com. Okay. And uh, email is arn, A-R-N, at and what investwithspark.com. And spark .com. stand for? Simplify, preserve, accelerate, Fantastic. reap, and knowledge. So try to simplify people's investments, preserve their capital, 
accelerate their capital growth, reap the benefits of real estate investing through kind of knowledge and education. So it also kind of fits my personality. I tend to be a little bit upbeat and like to have fun. So uh, Spark is a good... Uh, I don't know, metaphor. Fantastic. For well, kind of listeners, hey, this guy is a good yeah. guy. He's been in the business for a long time. If you've listened to this whole episode, you can hear that he is conservative and he wants to be involved in the right deals and take care of his investors. He's a great person to, to learn from. Uh, so check him out. And um, until next week, signing off. Thank you for watching Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. If you liked the episode, please click the like button and subscribe to the show. If you already are subscribed, then thank you. And please share the show with a friend. Check out other free resources at darrenbatchelder.com slash learn. 